Okay, um, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, thanks for that lovely introduction, Rhiannon. Um, as Rhiannon said, I've been involved with the BCB since its inception in 2009. And that's really the, the structure of my, my talk this afternoon. So um, th this first image is from, um, from my involvement at the last BCB, uh, which was to be one of the artists that took part in an exhibition at the Potteries Museum called Cultural Icons. Uh, and we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So next slide, Alison. Um, I've got a little bit of a preamble just to explain um, why I love ceramics so much and why I'm so interested and involved in ceramics. Uh, there's two images here, one's, one's very old and one's very new. Uh, the one on the left is uh, an, a very ancient piece of ceramic. It's a Babylonian map of uh, the then known world. So it's a piece of ceramic that goes back to the origins of civilization and really tells us across, those, across that distance, across that geographical spread, across that time spread, uh, what was happening in that place at that time about that culture. And it's one of the things that ceramics does beautifully uh, because it's a material that will break obviously, but then once it's broken, it, it remains forever. It doesn't disintegrate like wood or it doesn't get melted down like precious metal. So it's one of the materials that speak to us about across culture and across time. Um, the image on the right is Paul Scott, who's also showing it part of um, BCB this time uh, up on the Spode site. Uh, and this is quite a recent piece. Um, again, it's got that beautiful mix of history and contemporary. It's an old Staffordshire plate um, with an image of Palestine, one of those kind of traveler's plates, um, very exotic image of Palestine. What Paul's done is to erase part of that image and then reprint an image uh, of contemporary bombing in Gaza. So he's mixing the history and the new with a very kind of poignant effect and ceramics does this very well this speaking about telling stories and having a political position um, to uh, to take on things next uh, and an, another historical example is one of my favorite pieces of ceramic of all time um, this was made in the 1920s it's a soviet chess set and it's just this wonderful piece of political propaganda. Uh, it was made in Soviet Russia after the, um, after the um, communist takeover, uh, at the time where there was still a civil war going on between red Russians and white Russians. But the Soviets had taken over the state porcelain factories, subverted their production from making table settings for the czars to making things in support of the people and the revolution uh, and produce this piece of political propaganda. So the, the reds, are, everything on the red side is great, you know, heroic workers striding across the fields. Everything on the white side is bad, they're the capitalists, the workers are bound in chains. So regardless of your politics, it's just an extraordinary piece of political narrative and propaganda and been kind of very inspiring to me across my career. Um, next, please. So, a um, piece of mine on the right and a historical piece of Staffordshire ceramics on the left. Um, the old piece is by Obadiah Sherratt, um, Staffordshire flatback. Politeau's Menagerie, it speaks about the time when uh, the traveling circus went around town and that was the biggest thing that, that happened in people's lives when it came to town. Uh, and my version on the right is a kind of updating of that. This, this is from 1990s when I was making very, very modeled, very figurative uh, work. And it's called Dixon's Menagerie of Scary Monsters. And it's about the things that were happening in the world that I wanted to kind of speak about. So there's Ronald McDonald is the ringmaster, uh, Madonna's in there, there's a Russian bear and a British lion, Rambo represents America. So it's a kind of cartoonized version of political contemporary events. Uh, in 1998, uh, just a little bit after that piece, um, 
I joined uh, Manchester School of Arts at Manchester Metropolitan University uh, as a research fellow in ceramics and print. And I'd been dabbling a little bit in ceramic and print prior to that, inspired, I guess, by Paul Scott. Um, and this was an opportunity for me to really get my teeth into that. Um, and these are two of my kind of biggest heroes, I suppose. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg on the left, uh, with his beautiful layering of printed narrative, and Eduardo Paolozzi on the right, who was uh, one of my tutors at the RCA, and a kind of pioneer of collage and just um, putting images together from disparate sources. Um, and these, these two influences were very important to my, um, my work with print and ceramics. So the, um, uh, the role at Manchester School of Art was to um, develop printmaking processes for um, a mixed craft department. And the first task I had was to make um, a user-friendly way of screen printing transfers. Uh, the industry traditionally prints them in oil-based um, materials, and we weren't able to use oil-based materials in the art school. It had to be water-based. So I had to kind of adapt the traditional method of um, working with transfers to use water-based screen printing. Um, this is one of the big, uh, one of the early projects that came out of that. It was an exhibition called 21 Countries. And I suppose it's putting, hanging my kind of um, flag on the, on the mast, if that isn't a mixed metaphor, um, about... Um, my kind of political views at the time. So this was 2003. It was when uh, the big build-up to the war on Iraq was happening. Uh, the information on the right came from the popular press, uh, from um, New Internationalist magazine, where it was saying, you know, America's bombed 21 countries since, since World War II, which is quite a kind of scary statistic. Uh, and I used that as the basis for this exhibition, which was a series of 21 plates that kind of unpicked that statistic uh, in the build-up to the war. So initially, I was going to make um, one plate for each one of those countries. In the end, it became a kind of installation of 21 plates that sort of unpicked the narrative of, of the build-up to war at the time. Um, the exhibition was made for um, the Imperial War Museum North in Manchester. Uh, and it was quite a successful exhibition and it toured quite a lot and ended up in the Museum of Art and Design in New York, which is on the right, uh, where it got into their permanent collection and it's been kind of brought out several times since then. So it's, it's been a, it, was a, it was an exhibition that worked for me really well in, in terms of kind of um, getting the work out and getting it internationalized, I suppose. Next. And this is a detail of, of one of those plates. So it's not specifically one of those countries. It's, it's about this notion of Western culture and on the one hand being very capable of creating great beauty, but on the other hand, capable of um, doing great damage. Uh, at the same time as making lots of plates. Uh, I was also making three-dimensional vessels and looking at, um, looking at metal vessels as, as a kind of source of inspiration to, to how to make these, um, these slab-built vessels. Um, the, there's a notion called skewomorphism, which is where one, uh, one material replicates the objects in another material. Uh, and ceramics does this quite a lot. A lot, a lot of ceramics um, replicate the forms of precious of, of vessels in precious metals to kind of emulate their value. Uh, and in this case, I'm using uh, oil cans and petrol cans to speak about the war on Iraq and the kind of underlying metaphor for that, which is the the, the, the need for the West to have oil supplies. Um, this particular piece. Um, kind of chronicles Tony Blair's involvement in that. So Tony, Tony Blair is the image on the print and is all, also the cartoon figure on the lid. Uh, this is him. So he's this kind of crusaderish figure with a teapot on his head. Um, 
and it's replicating and picking up on kind of contemporary cartoon culture of the time. So uh, this takes me up to um, 2009 and the, um, the creation of the British Ceramics Biennial. And as Rhiannon said, um, uh, the notion of, this, of the, uh, the biennial was, um, was conceived and Barney Hairduke and Jeremy Theophilus were the co-directors at the inception of the British Ceramics Biennial. Um, the, the notion of this, this big event, this big ceramics event in Stoke-on-Trent, the home of ceramics, um, was launched at an event in the January of that year uh, at the old Ainsley factory, and that's the building on the left, um, lit up in the, the BCB pink, which has stayed, <laughs> stayed right throughout the, the branding of the BCB. Uh, and a number of, um, a number of ceramic artists uh, were invited to go into the, into the, uh, the building. Uh, it had become uh, empty and wasn't being used uh, as a factory, but it was still full of all the stuff, all of the ephemera of production. Uh, and we were invited in to, to kind of scavenge around and find things and make some temporary artworks that would be shown at the uh, opening event, the launch event in January. I think I must have been the first one in because I found the flowers first and we found um, palette after palette of these beautiful handmade bone china flowers that had been bisque fired but not glaze fired or coloured. So they were in this very pristine white state, but also in the state which is the most strong of, of the multiple firings. Um, and so I got the chance to use these. And what I did with these was to, uh, to, to create a fake pillar with, within, the, um, within the central space of the hall where the opening event was going to be. So it was quite a discreet piece. You could come into the building and miss it. Um, but then you would see it and kind of, um, the idea was you'd be overtaken by the beauty of these flowers, although they were presented in a very subtle way. Uh, and this is my daughter Joyce, who was my assistant for the project. Uh, we found something like um, 35 or 40,000 flowers and used, um, used several thousand of them in the making of this column. Uh, and there's the finished column and there's a detail of the flowers. Um, you can see the flowers. Um, lots of people have, have worked with these flowers. Neil Brownsword has done a lot of work with the flowers and the flower makers since this. Uh, Claire Toomey has done work with these flowers too. So they've become a kind of icon of uh, hand making in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, Having got my hands on the flowers, I was reluctant to let them go. And that, that kind of, uh, I guess that earned me part ownership of the flowers. So um, I was asked, I was commissioned to do one of the um, commissioned exhibitions as part of the first biennial in uh, September 2009 uh, at the Gladstone Museum. And what I decided to make was to, to, to build something that was the biggest I could make using all of the flowers or as many of the flowers as possible. Um, and what I made was, was a piece called Monopoly, which is based on the battleship token of um, the game Monopoly. This was 2009, it was shortly after 2008 on the banking crisis, uh, crisis in the economy, also a crisis kind of kicking into Stoke-on-Trent and industry employment. Uh, so it was a kind of piece that, that um, commemorated that crisis, almost like a giant wreath made of these flowers. Um, I was interested in the game Monopoly because uh, it has this amazing history. Um, it has the version we play now, uh, but it's based on an older game called the Landlord's Game, which was invented by an American Quaker called Elizabeth Meiji. Uh, she was a Quaker and a socialist, and she used this game that she invented uh, to demonstrate, as she saw it, the iniquities of capitalism. So you played the game as a landlord or as a tenant, and at the end of the game, the landlords had all the money and the tenants had no money. So it was a kind of demonstration. Uh, and it went through several iterations and became much more of a kind of 
multiply capitalist game, which is what we play now, where we all try and bankrupt each other. So it was a kind of interesting irony to play with. Uh, the next slide is the finished piece. Um, it was a great project to do here um, as part of the BCB because it involved a lot of volunteers. So I kind of orchestrated it and worked on it and designed it, but then lots of volunteers did the physical making of it. Um, and it also had that great thing that, that I've always said about the BCB, that it, it gives makers an opportunity to step out of their comfort zone and do something really challenging, really innovative, isn't their normal practice. Um, and gives the sort of support and the funding and the enthusiasm to, to just go for it. So this was by far the biggest and the most ambitious thing I'd, I'd ever made up to this point. Uh, so, um, Rhiannon said I'd been involved right from the start. So putting the slides together, I worked out I've been involved in every BCB since the start. So I've kind of got my season ticket here. Um, I was slightly less involved in 2011. Um, be, between, the, between the two um, festivals, I'd done a residency at the Victorian Albert Museum looking at portraiture and the, uh, the political portraiture in the Victorian Albert Museum collection. And partly while I was there, but then uh, following on from the residency, I made a series of um, ceramic political portraits. Uh, the image on the left is one of the v &A portraits of Ho Chi Minh. Uh, the, the next one along is the first piece I made during the, uh, the v &A residency. And it's actually a Janus head. It has two faces. So this is the front face, which is a youthful face, which is looking forward. Um, on the back, it has an older face, which is looking backwards. And it was meant to be a kind of metaphor for the v &A, the way it looks back to its historical collections and also looks forward to the contemporary and its support for contemporary makers. So it was a bit of an homage to the v &A, the first piece. Um, what I went on to do from that was to make um, a trilogy of three larger portrait heads uh, made in this kind of composite, fragmented way uh, that were looking at, um, I guess, my political heroes. They were, they were mainly prisoners of conscience. conscience. Um, so the, the, the first one was Aung San Suu Kyi, who's, um, I guess I've been a bit of a hostage to fortune in this because Aung San Suu Kyi for a long time was the, uh, the poster girl for human rights. And more re recently, she's kind of um, been, um, been much more kind of chastised for her support of um, uh, the, uh, the military rulers in Myanmar. And now again, she's, she's back and fallen foul of them again. So she's back on the, the side of the angels again. Uh, so I guess making work that is political, you are always kind of subject to, to, to events overtaking you. Um, but she was, the first, she was the first one. Um, and in, in researching on Sang Suu Kyi, I realized that she was the, um, one of only three um, winners of the Nobel Peace Prize that hadn't been able to receive their award because they were prisoners of conscience. So that was the reason for making this triptych of, of three, uh, three portraits. Next. Um, uh, the second one was um, a Chinese dissident called Lu Chaobo, who was imprisoned in um, 2009 for advocating democracy in China. He's part of a group called um, Charter, uh, Charter 8, I think. Um, and so he is, th this was very much in the news at the time as I, I was making this. Um, and then the third image, uh, the third of these portraits was the very first winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, not, to, not to gain his award, Karl von Ossietzky, who was, um, he was a German newspaper man. He spoke up against the rise of fascism in Germany in the 1930s and was uh, imprisoned, put into a concentration camp where he died. Uh, he wasn't put to death, he died of disease there. Uh, and of course, wasn't able to get his, um, get his award. 
um, and the images, some of the images on the right, some of the research that I did in the, um, the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo. So that became, those three pieces together became quite a kind of coherent group. Um, and some of those, sorry, this is a long, <laughs> long explanation of its connection to the BCB. Uh, two, two, I think three of those pieces were featured in BCB 2011 as part, part of the award exhibition, which was in the Potteries Museum that year. So uh, next, please. Uh, rolling on to the next BCB in 2013, um, there were a number of um, small commissions made for kind of one-off projects uh, around the Spold site for that BCB. Uh, I was lucky enough to get one of these commissions and to work with a group of students from Manchester School of Art, uh, students and volunteers. And we worked on the Spode site, uh, a project that was very much focused on Josiah Spode himself. Uh, next, please. So we, we, we came up with a project called Excavate. Uh, and what we did, we, we did um, a bit of real excavation outside in the car park behind the building uh, where we were working and used the, uh, the, the bottom of the lift shaft in the China Hall as our working area and took the material from outside and filled up the lift shaft as if it was an excavation inside. So we created a kind of fictional uh, excavation inside the spoke site. Uh, we built a little bit of a structure that looked a bit like the base of a kiln. Uh, but it was really quite clear from the way it was staged that it was kind of a sham and it was a performance. Although lots of, pe lots of people did kind of go along with the, um, go along with the story. Uh, and we had a lot of fun re-excavating this material and picking all the beautiful shards out of it because any time you put a spade in the ground on the spoiled site, you're bringing up this historical material. Um, and we categorized it and we drew it um, and made a little installation alongside the excavation where um, all of the volunteers made uh, beautiful uh, archaeological drawings of the fragments that they were finding. And then these were printed and printed onto the plates that over the course of the six or eight weeks of the BCB kind of assembled into this little um, installation. Uh, next. And then right at the end, there was um, in the very last weekend, there was the culminating piece, uh, which was a complete fiction, but based on the idea or the story that Josiah Spode, uh, before he was a potter, was a street musician and played the violin, uh, which is a historically documented fact, uh, but not that this was actually his violin. So it's a, it's a kind of um, conceit that he might have made a ceramic violin and it might have looked like this. And we pretended to find all of these fragments in the excavation, put it together at the end and displayed it as if it was a, um, a real find from the excavation. Um, so it was, I called it a factional narrative because it's a mixture of fact and fiction. Uh, and it was a lot of fun to do. Next one. A um, bit more serious here. 2015 um, falls into the, um, the period of the um, centenary of World War I. And I'd already been involved with quite a number of projects um, around that centenary, uh, working with museums in Stoke-on-Trent. And because of that, um, I was invited along with my MMU colleague, Johnny McGee, who's a filmmaker, um, to, um, to make a temporary monument to the soldiers of North Staffordshire, the North Staffordshire Regiment, who had lost their lives in World War I. Uh, and what we ended up with was, was a big clay head that is, um, it's taken from the head of the Nike victory medal that all the soldiers from World War I were given, um, sculpted by uh, William McNichol. And I took the head and grossly enlarged it and made it out of two tons of 
um, Staffordshire Etruria Marl, so it was made of the material of Staffordshire in a way. Um, it was made uh, a, somewhere between a coil pot and an igloo. I don't know if you, anybody remembers making igloos when you cut, a, cut slices of, um, um, of ice and assemble them into this hollow igloo. So it was a hollow form but made out of quite a thick wall. Um, but nevertheless was two tons of clay and the, the reason it has those little circles on it uh, they, they are the points that are holding it to an internal structure to stop it kind of bursting and falling apart um, that was the center of the installation um, but it was actually part, part of a kind of environment um, Johnny sort of orchestrated the environment with, with a very eerie soundtrack that was based on um, a song from World War I. And the, the room itself was dark and it, it had a bit of a kind of cathedral sort of quality. And people were invited, um, we reused the flowers again, people were invited to attach flowers to the structure around the sculpture uh, and attach little tokens and little mementos and little comments to their their loved ones. So it became a kind of votive space for people to um, remember relatives that might have been lost in World War One, but also remember relatives more generally was, was kind of what happened, I guess. Next, please. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit because I'm taking too long here. Um, we're two BCBs away from the end. Uh, 2017 kind of rolled that forward um, a little bit um, in that we continued a project uh, working with Johnny again and with, with other colleagues from RMU. Um, we, we raised some funding from um, uh, an academic um, source to look at the issue of refugees in World War I, to look at the issue of Belgian refugees uh, but to do that through the lens of contemporary refugees. And this is where we started working with the Burslem Jubilee Group, who are a group of contemporary refugees and asylum seekers in Stoke-on-Trent. Uh, these are artifacts from Belgian refugees and from the kind of fundraising uh, events of the time where people in the UK were trying to raise fun funds to support the Belgians who'd fled from the, the early days of World War I. Uh, from Belgium into um, southern England. And the, 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 there was a kind of parallel to a lot of their stories to contemporary refugees. Uh, next, please. Um, and the refugee group were, were very interested in those objects, and they were particularly interested in the medals for peace that were part of those objects. So we had a, a small project working with one of my colleagues, Elle Sims, who was a jeweler, uh, to make their own medals for peace. And there was a whole series of these uh, which were, um, were installed in BCB 2017 in quite a modest display there, actually. Uh, next, please. Um, as well as this, we worked with, um, we worked with a writer. Um, uh, sorry, I've got some crib notes here for names. Um, Barry Taylor was the writer um, and came up with a narrative and a story and, and a very beautiful prose poem that um, told, told this story, um, told the contemporary refugee story and then related it to the Belgian refugees. Um, so this is some of, the, um, some of the working notes and then a series of plates which were printed with this poem. Next, please. Uh, rolling on from that, we... Um, used the texts, uh, used the kind of handwritten qualities of the, um, the refugees' writing to create uh, a series of moulds of letters. Next. And then these were used, um, we, we ran workshops make, making dozens and dozens of these letters, and then used these letters to spell out the poem in um, various uh, liminal landscapes, you know, landscapes between land and sea and one state and another. Um, and it ended up as a, a very lyrical um, film which kind of chronicled the project um, with the refugees and 
spoke a lot with their voice. Uh, and this is one of the most poignant of the, the lines in the poem. Uh, this is another still from the film, uh, and you can see in this case, this is one of the early lines in the poem, uh, and in the film the, the, the waves come in and just push the letters around. Uh, very beautiful. Uh, and I mentioned Johnny McGee is the filmmaker. Uh, <coughs> BCB 2009, I was involved in a project called Cultural Icons, uh, which was... Um, Curated, uh, curated by Christy Brown, who is one of the award artists, and Tessa Peters. Uh, and it was to look at the history of Staffordshire Flatbacks. And they asked five contemporary makers to make their own kind of versions of what a Staffordshire Flatback might be uh, today. Uh, so these were my versions. This is a couple of years ago. Um, Donald Trump couldn't be out of the news um, at all at that time, so he features in quite a number of them. Um, this one's called Political Philosophy. Uh, next, please. Um, and I had a great time doing this project. I kind of set myself um, a set of rules that I could only use things that were made from found objects. So I was collecting lots of plastic rubbish and charity shop finds. Um, taking plaster casts of those and then casting them into ceramic and assembling them into ceramic objects. So on the left is some of the things I was collecting, on the right are some of the casts before they're put together. Next please. Uh, this is one of those pieces, uh, again two years ago, we couldn't, couldn't move without Brexit in the news, so this is my kind of, um, my thoughts on Brexit. And then the last one is the Trumposaurus, which depicts Trump as that, uh, that brilliant um, um, balloon of Donald Trump as a baby sort of inspired this. But he's, um, he's a baby, a dinosaur. He's also got some very um, unpleasant genitals that come from a, a cast of a key ring. Uh, and he has a nuclear button on his back, which is quite scary, really. And this brings us up to now. Um, so um, I applied for a ward again this time and was, um, was very uh, lucky and very happy to be selected uh, as one of the shortlisted artists. Uh, this was my drawing uh, as my proposal uh, around the idea of the Ship of Fools, uh, kind of loosely based on the Ship of Fools, I suppose. Mine is the Ship of Dreams and Nightmares. Um, and it's meant to represent the stereotype image of a Mediterranean refugee boat, the kind of boat we see sinking in the Mediterranean because it's overloaded with desperate refugees trying to get to the West. Um, the, the central premise of it is that it's made in majolica. It's made in white tin glazed earthenware. And the connection between that and the narrative is that the the migration route of Majolica uh, from North Africa ultimately to the UK uh, follows a very similar route to the migration route of contemporary refugees. Next slide. So uh, in the center there is a map of contemporary migration routes. And then around that we have various historical versions of white tin glazed earthenware. Um, it's use, it's, it always begins as, as pure white, and then it's very heavily decorated with, with tin oxides. Um, so essentially, the, um, the, um, the technique originated in the 9th century in Iran, in the, in the top left there. It spread into Moorish Spain in 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, uh, when Spain was occupied by um, Islam. Uh, from Spain, it went to Italy and then was massive during the Renaissance. Uh, from Spain, it, it, was, it, it was exported from Majorca in Spain to Italy, which is why it became called Majolica. Uh, it was very popular in Italy, spread throughout Italy, and then spread further up into Europe. It went into France in the top right, uh, where it was called Fayence because it went to France from Faenza in Italy. 
and then it went up into Holland, by which time it's picking up kind of Chinese influences stylistically. And then from Holland, it came over to the UK, um, uh, again, um, because of political refugees, um, uh, refugees flee, uh, Huguenot refugees fleeing, um, fleeing the Inquisition, um, settled in Norwich originally, and then the technique spread through the UK. So, sorry, that's a, that's a rather long-winded explanation of my central idea that the two, the two migration routes are similar. So that's my rationale for using the material and telling the story. Uh, and I think this is probably my last slide. So this, this is the final realization of, um, of the refugee boat, the ship of dreams and nightmares. So it, it represents both the dream of, um, of refuge in a place of safety, but also the, the nightmare of becoming a refugee and the refugee journey. Um, it differs from the original drawing in quite a number of details. The original drawing was kind of just my idea of what I thought those objects might be that would represent the story. Um, in its realization, I uh, worked again with the Burslem Jubilee Group. Um, we would have worked directly were it not for COVID, but we worked, um, we had a number of Zoom meetings and lots of conversations about what these objects might be. So we talked about the ideas I had for the initial objects. Some of those they thought were appropriate. Some of those they absolutely refused to countenance, which was really interesting. Uh, and then they suggested lots of other objects uh, that told their own very particular and very specific stories. Uh, some of which are quite general, you know, the, the idea that uh, that when you're a refugee in a new country, education is massively important. Um, also the idea that hygiene in the journey of being a refugee is massively important. So some of the objects represent those things. Um, and there are very particular things. Um, there's a number of bricks in there, for instance. So one of the refugees told me that he, um, he came to Europe encased in a almost in a sarcophagus of bricks in the back of a lorry so he was put into a lorry encased in bricks and driven somewhere no idea where he'd end up or whether he'd even get out of it um, so each of the things has some kind of connection to that collection of stories um, and i think i'll leave it there so thank you very much i'm sorry i've run over a little bit <laughs> <laughs>